Hi, my name is John Gibbons and I am an osteopath and I teach a uh, complex subject called spinal motion. It's also known as spinal mechanics. The era is actually from uh, 1903. So there was a chap called Robert Lovett and he had an idea about motion of the spine. And then later on, there was a chap called Harrison Fryatt, who was a, an osteopath, and he uh, dictated the, the principles or the laws of spinal mechanics. So when people talk about the type one mechanics of the type two, it's all stemmed from Lovett, but later on with the work from Fryatt. And also there's a guy called Nelson who talked about another motion called a, a type three or principle three. Uh, and there's also a guy called Grakovetsky. And I use the word 1988 because he has a video on YouTube that shows a, um, an amputee walking because he has a notion about um, the spine being an engine and he calls it the spinal engine. And, and, and I put my name down there. Why? Because I believe I'm, I'm keeping um, the, the legend of the, the spinal motion going. It's only because people say to me, John, you're teaching old school stuff. And I said, well, if it's old school, what's new school? And no one really gives me an answer because the concept they are using in modern, say, um, osteopathic or chiropractic school is all originated from the old school methodology. So nothing's really changed as such. There's a different thought process. But I always think you have to understand one way, whether it's the right way or the wrong way, you have to understand one method. And then once you understand it, then you can then try to consider, is that the correct way? And if not, how you would change or adapt what you originally thought. I know it sounds hard to, to, to talk about that, but let's just go through the, the talk anyway, and then it might just give you some, some ideas. Now, the ideal position of the spine, when you're in a fetal position, you only have one curve, that's the flexion curve, okay? So the primary curve will be a kyphosis. But when you are born and you stand up and walk, then you develop your secondary curves, which is the cervical lordosis and the lumbar lordosis. But you still got the two primary curves of the sacral kyphosis yeah, and then the thorax kyphosis in here. So this would be what we call a neutral spine. Um, it's hard to say what neutral is. Neutral in terms of the spine basically means where the facet joints are idling. So they're not in a position of extension, neither are they in a position of flexion. Because if you look at this picture here, this is obviously not ideal. This is what's called a flat back. And we've got a posterior tilt of the pelvis. Sacrum is in a word called counter-nutated here. But more importantly, the lumbar spine is flat here. Okay, so this would be in a non-neutral position because they are in flexion. Vice versa, if we have this position where we have a hyperlordosis, the pelvis is anteriorly tilted, the sacrum is nutated, but now the lumbar is forced into extension. So again, we have what we call a non-neutral spine. So in 1918, Fryer discussed the neutral position for the spine and he said, it is defined to mean the position of any area of the spine in which the facets are idling. So what that means is they are not in a flexion position, neither are they in a position of extension. So they idle between the two. So this is what it basically means. So the facet joints are neither in a closed position of extension, nor in a state of flexion and open. So they idle between the two positions of flexion and extension, so they idle. Now, neutral also means type one, and Lovett, in his earlier work, looked at the spine where he said, if we had a straight spine and we side bend it to one side, it only bends to one side. So we bend it to the left, it only bends to the left, but that's not a neutral spine. So when you put the spine into neutral, which is where the facets are idling, they're not in extension closed or flexion open, he noticed when we side bend it to one side now, there was a horizontal rotation to the opposite side. So side bending to the right introduced rotation to the left and it's known as coupled motion. And vice versa, so this would be a type one, but if you type two, so if you are in an extended position and you side bend, he noticed now that the vertebra seemed to rotate to the same side and he would call that type two 
or non-neutral mechanics. So let's just look a bit more into that. This is a type one. So we have a side bending to the left and we have a rotation to the right. And you can see the facet joint in here is relatively closed and the facet joint here is relatively open. So we are in a side bent rotation to the opposite side. So this is called a type one. This would be typical with patients with maybe a scoliosis. So where you have a group dysfunction of neutral. So where three or four segments are side bending left and then we have a rotation to the right. But then if we ask our patient to side bend, where are we going? Technology. If you look into my hand here, you can see that the fullness is on the opposite side. So the patient is side bending to the left, but the rotation is coming to the right. So the fullness of the muscle will be on that side. So that indicates that the spine is capable of performing a type one mechanic. Let's look at type two. So non-neutral mechanic states, which is type two, side bending on the vertebra is coupled with a horizontal rotation to the same side. So if you side bend to the right, the vertebra rotates to the right. Type two, also known as principle two or law two. So in this case, side bending to the left now, the rotation is to the same side. So this would be, if a person is in extension, or they are in flexion and side bend, it rotates to the same side. And when you palpate the patient this time, the fullness is on the same side. So instead of being on the opposite side, like type one, it'll be on the same side, indicating that you've got a type two dysfunction. So neutral mechanics is type one, and non-neutral mechanics is type two. Okay, that's the name for it. Now, if it is a type three, and that was by Nelson in 48. And what Nelson states is that when motion is introduced in one plane, the motion in the other two planes is reduced. So for instance, if I'm in an extension, and then I try to side bend or try to rotate, then it is more difficult. So then that would be a type three type of mechanic. Now, Krakowetsky, he stated that he considered the spine to be the primary engine in the role of locomotion. So he said that the arms and the legs are instruments of expression, so we don't need them to ambulate because the spine is the engine that's responsible for motion. And I quite like this picture because I talk about the spine as an engine, so hence the word spinal engine. So this is all about, but it's all related to the motion uh, or the type one mechanics. He does have a video, let's see if I can play this. Okay, so you can see here that the person has no arms, okay, or stumps and no legs, but you can see that they are able to walk on their ischial tuberosities, okay, along here. Okay, this is taken from the 1988 Rakovetsky. Now, to allow this to happen, naturally, ideally, we'd have legs, yeah, um, and then you can see this is the walking gait cycle, but we take it for granted that this is what is happening. So when we are walking, you can see that one leg is forward into flexion, but the innominate is back on that side. So this would be the stance phase of gait, the contact phase, and then this is the swing phase. It's around 60% to 40%, yeah, give or take. But the important bit is, is that the hip is in flexion, but the pelvis is posteriorly rotated, the knees in extension, the ankle dorsiflexed, yeah, along here, and the foot will be slightly inverted as you hit the ground. But let's just move up a bit to the pelvis. So the pelvis is posteriorly rotated, and then that will pre-tension this key ligament called the sacrotuberous ligament in here. Now, if you notice, you might notice that this has come back, but do not think that the sacrum looks like it's rotated to the left side here. Why? Because as that goes back, this ligament is tension in, in here, okay? So it almost like um, causes a counter rotation. Let me explain that a bit more as we go through, because it's easier to do it here. The sacrum has many axes. We, we've got like a, uh, a superior, a middle and inferior. We've got a vertical axis. But the two of concern will be the right oblique axis here and the left oblique axis. 
and in theory, let's just look at this one. This is the sacrum, okay, an idea of the sacrum. This would be a neutral position, and the sacrum is capable of rotating to the right on the right axis. So this is called a right on right. So the sacrum is basically naturally tilted and is rotating to the right axis. So this side is nutation, so it's gone forward. This side has come back in here. And you can see this is a, an idea of what happens. So when the sacrum is bending to the right, okay, it is rotating to the right on the right oblique axis in here. This is not showing you the sacrum. This is trying to mimic the position of the sacrum. And it's easy sometimes to show the patient bending to mimic the motion. When the sacrum comes back to neutral, it now has to then rotate to the left on the left axis, which you can see in this case has gone forward. This side will come backwards. But remember, we've got the two anominate bones on the side here that are naturally rotating. So as the two anominates are rotating, they are driving the sacrum into this left on left or right on right axis. And you can see in this case, it is rotating to the left on the left axis. So that's what it's trying to indicate here. Let's try, show you this one. You might find this one easier to understand. So this is called a right on right sacral axis. So the sacrum is rotating to the right. But what the sacrum does, it introduces a motion of the lumbar to rotate to the left. Why? Because it's like a type one mechanic. So as the sacrum is rotating to the right, it will side bend to the left. But then that will induce the cog in the wheel to turn the second cog the opposite way. So as the sacrum is rotating to the right, the lumbar now rotates to the left, but side bends to the right because it is a type one mechanic. And then as the lumbar is rotating to the left, it induces the third cog in the wheel to then rotate to the right with a side bending. It is like the, the snake in the grass, that vermicular motion. So as the innominates are rotating, it's driving the sacrum to rotate right on right and left on left, which drives the lumbar to rotate to the opposite side of the sacrum, which then forces the thorax to rotate to the opposite side of the lumbar. Add in the pelvis. Okay, we add in the pelvis here. So now you can see the two innominates. This one's going forward, this one's coming back. And as it's driving, because it's like a drive train, the spinal engine, it's rotating the sacrum, and the lumbar is going to the opposite side. But this is the, probably the best picture, yeah, along here. So you can see the ligament, the sacrotuberous ligament, the bicep femoris. So this is in the swing phase. So this right hip is coming posterior, so the leg is coming through, yeah, along here, just before contact phase. And then as it comes back, it allows the sacrum to rotate to the left on the left axis, and then naturally this is in the stance phase. So you can see as the anomalies are rotating, it's driving the sacrum, which then drives the lumbar. So that's a little bit about the motion of the pelvis and the lumbar, the type one and the type two mechanics, or the laws or the principles, you know, also known as Friot's laws. So I will be um, producing another video on uh, dysfunction of type two mechanics called ERS and FRS. So I hope you're able to, to watch that. But if you have any, any questions, then feel free to, to send me an email or just uh, leave comment in the appropriate box. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed it.